and technical support for acoustical and air distribution equipment. I will now hand it off to you, Ryan. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you, Julia. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for um, air outlets and mixed air distribution selection. Um, my name is Ryan Compton. I am the application engineering manager mm -hmm. for grills, registers, and diffusers at Price Industries. And in regards to our course itself, um, mixed air, overhead mixed air distribution systems um, are what I consider the typical uh, mixed air distribution system. And uh, that type of system has been used for over 100 years to condition our built environment. The course will look at um, basic overhead mixed air distribution systems, configurations of grills and diffusers, and how to apply their performance to select the correct device. The learning objectives, hopefully at the conclusion of this webinar, uh, you have a better understanding of how air moves through a room and a, a mixed air system. Understand the basics of grills, registers, and diffusers and how they function, as well as understand it, uh, a better understanding of the fundamentals of good air distribution design, including throw, supplier, temperatures, coanda effect, inlet conditions, and sound. So we're going to start off by taking a quick look at systems, uh, then moving into catalog performance and factors that affect performance, then look at different product types, or as I like to say, tools in the toolbox, and product uh, finish off with a, a product selection example. So the system, what does this mean? Um, I like to start off with this just to talk about the very basics of an air distribution system. Of course, we have our air handler, which supplies our air to the building. Um, this is gonna be our source of heating and cooling. Typically, there's filtration. Uh, this is where we're gonna add our fresh air requirement. There may be different energy efficient uh, components within that. But the key is the air handler is providing air to the system which is controlled, or the volume of that air is controlled to by the thermal unit. And that thermal unit is typically connected to a thermostat of some type to modulate air volume to the space. And that brings us to our air outlets, our grills, registers, and diffusers, uh, which are located in the um, throughout the building and used to distribute the air throughout the space. Uh, the reality is we can spend um, hundreds of thousands of dollars on chillers and boilers and fans, um, but if our air outlets are improperly selected, um, it's going to not reach the zone, it's not going to achieve the design goals. So the goal of this presentation is to look at air outlets within this system. So I would like to start by looking at um, what we have here is uh, a square plaque diffuser in a mixed air system. This video is from our flow visualization room where we have the capability of putting theatrical smoke through the air outlet. Um, this is an example, like I said, of a square plaque diffuser, um, the air coming out, traveling along the ceiling and into the room. If we take a look from a side view, this side view lets us see that high velocity air leaving the diffuser and clinging to the ceiling as it moves outward. If we advance this video, uh, we can see as it moves away, it entrains room air and starts to slow down. Ideally, that air jet uh, should be traveling about 50 feet per minute when it enters the occupied zone. And because it is mixing with room air, um, that temperature should start to approach our room temperature. Advancing it a little further again, uh, the air entering the occupied zone and uh, should start to travel back up towards the diffuser. Uh, this is the room air mixing that we are looking for within a mixed air distribution system. Advancing it a little further, uh, we can see that as it comes back up to the ceiling, that air is going to be entrained again into that uh, high velocity diffuser air. And this cycle will continually repeat, um, ideally mixing all of the air in the room so that we have a consistent uh, temperature and quality of air throughout the space. So why do we do this? Well, um, as I alluded to in that smoke video, the idea of air quality, um, dealing with dust, dirt, particulate that is will come into the room, uh, aerosol, so looking at viruses, we've all made it through a pandemic. So the, uh, the idea of air quality and, and dealing with um, those aerosols in the space 
And as people, uh, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out CO2. And we know with uh, better building envelopes, um, you know, the idea of ensuring that we have sufficient fresh air throughout the building uh, is very important to maintaining a good air quality. The other aspect of it is thermal comfort. And of course, the temperature, our dry bulb temperature uh, is something that we want to maintain through heating and cooling, but also our wet bulb or our relative humidity within the space and maintaining that at a reasonable level to uh, achieve thermal comfort. And the last part, and this factors into air outlets, is the idea of minimizing drafts. And uh, drafts can certainly be perceived as uncomfortable um, to occupants if it's uh, continuously higher velocity airs than, than what they uh, expect. So what is the occupied zone? Um, well, we define it as six feet above the finished floor, one foot off an interior wall, and three feet off an exterior wall. Uh, unfortunately, if you were seven feet tall, you were doomed to a life of being less thermally comfortable and, and may experience poor air quality. Um, but that's not me. Uh, that's actually defining that six foot level. Uh, the idea of one foot off an interior wall versus three foot off an exterior wall a lot of times in exterior or perimeter spaces, uh, we are um, trying to wash the window or uh, basically treat the glazing on the exterior of the building uh, from floor to ceiling. So again, minimizing that draft in that space. Next, I would like to discuss the air out outlets themselves. Uh, so starting off with grills and this definition is a grill is a device that covers the opening um, to an air passage. They may be used for supply or return. And uh, I've definitely heard contractors tell me that it's just a hole filler, but I do like to believe that this is an engineered product and when designed correctly uh, is an important piece of designing a good mixed air distribution system and achieving our goals of room air mixing, room air motion, and again, that thermal comfort and, and indoor air quality that we're trying to achieve. So looking quickly at a couple types of grills before we uh, get into the performance data, the idea that grills could be a fixed deflection, and this is an example of an egg crate grill. Um, typically, return grills are fixed blade. Single blade deflection, so this has one set of blades and a double deflection grill, which has uh, two sets of blades, one horizontally and one vertically. Uh, so single deflection, you can get horizontal or vertical. In the case of double deflection, you have both sets of blades. Uh, they are used for supply applications, and in most cases, those uh, single and double deflection grills will, have, will be adjustable um, for a supply application. So looking at a catalog page for a grill, uh, we have a single deflection louvered face grill example here, and there's a lot of information. And if I zoom in a little bit closer on the performance data itself, we can see that there are a range of sizes along the left-hand side. When it comes to the size of the grill, uh, we talk about two different dimensions, a nominal duct dimension and a core dimension. So that nominal duct dimension is uh, literally the opening uh, of the hole that you're trying to fill. Um, you know, if it is 8 by 4, 7 by 5, or 6 by 6 in this example, uh, all different widths by height, but they all have a similar core area. And it really is the core area that is going to drive the performance of the grill. In this case, all three of those grills have uh, a core area that's approximately 0.18 feet squared. And we can look at performance for that particular grill at a wide range of air velocities. Um, this table looks at air velocities between 300 feet per minute and 1800 feet per minute. And at those operating conditions, we provide a number of pieces of information, one being velocity pressure and the other being total pressure. Now, when we look at pressure, uh, velocity pressure is uh, basically the pressure created by air traveling down the duct. And this is true of all fluids 
and just the nature of it flowing down the ductwork, there is a direct correlation to the pressure, velocity pressure that's associated to that. When we talk about pressure, there's also static pressure. Static pressure is the pressure of the fluid just being uh, existing in that duct and acts equally in all directions. Total pressure is a combination or is the sum of your velocity pressure and your static pressure. Um, it's within the industry, um, it's not consistent uh, what types of pressure we're presenting, whether it's velocity pressure and total pressure, as I showed in the example here. But if we do, um, based on simple math, we can figure out the third piece of that puzzle. Um, so coming back to our catalog page or supply grill, because we have velocity and total pressure, we can figure out static pressure from that information. Moving down to throw, um, we present throw in a, a wide range of, of operating capacities. And so every good performance table should have notes describing what those performance aspects are. If we look here at note number four, and it is explaining that the values under throw are set at three different velocities, 150 feet per minute, 100 feet per minute, and 50 feet per minute. So in this example, at six feet away from the grill, we would expect 150 feet per minute. At nine feet away from the grill, we would expect 100 feet per minute. And at 19 feet, we would expect 50 feet per minute. If we look at this image here, this is that grill and that air flowing out away from the grill. And as the air flows away from the grill, it will slow down. Here we have again, uh, ISO valve. So not only um, you know, the distance away, but the pattern. And we can see at 100 feet per minute, again, we're traveling further away from that grill and that air is naturally spreading out and then 50 feet per minute. And in most cases, when we're designing, it is that 50 feet per minute value that we are most interested in. When we talk about throw and pattern, another aspect of that is spread, which I had previously mentioned. Spread will naturally occur as, a, as the air moves away from the air outlet. It will spread out as it's slowing down. The geometry of the air outlet will also dictate spread. So uh, blade configurations or just the um, you know shape of the diffuser uh, will provide different spread characteristics. Another aspect of pattern that we talk about is drop. And drop is the distance that um, the air falls as it's moving away. And because in most applications when we're talking about cooling, um, that delta T between the supply air and the room air uh, results in that cold, dense air wanting to come down. And our goal is to minimize that uh, because what we are trying to achieve in the occupied zone is 50 feet per minute. Or actually, let me correct that, we're trying to achieve 40 feet per minute or less in the occupied zone to minimize drafts. As a result, what we want to do is select that air outlet so that the air jet from the air outlet is approaching 50 feet per minute as we get to the occupied zone. Again, all of this is done uh, in an effort to try and minimize drafts in the occupied zone. Going back to the catalog page, that is, I guess, uh, a quick description of throw and, and what's important to us there. In the case of grills, we actually catalog throw lengths at three different um, blade angles. And this is because the blades are adjustable on site. If we look at this again in a, a plan view uh, and start with a zero degree deflection, we can see that zero degree deflection gives us a much narrower pattern, but that narrower pattern will travel further. This gives us longer throw lengths. When we're trying to design a space and, and select the appropriate product, that spread is important because as the pattern spreads more, as we can see here with a 22 and a half degree deflection, that with a wider spread, the length of the throw is shorter. And we can see with 45, it shortens even more. Next, I would like to look at uh, diffusers. And here is a ceiling diffuser. Uh, it's an outlet which discharges supply air in various directions and planes. Diffusers evenly distribute the air in desirable directions throughout the room and typically provide enhanced air entrainment 
over a grill. So what that definition means is basically, uh, well, it also is used to distribute air, uh, the configurations and the geometry of the diffuser tend to give us, um, you know, a, a tighter pattern, uh, a more distinct pattern, and in some cases, uh, a fixed pattern. Some are fixed, some are adjustable. Uh, what we look at here is a few examples of diffusers, and we'll cover the different types in a little bit more detail later. Uh, but when we're looking at whether it's a round cone, square plaque, louvered face, or, or high induction diffusers, they all have unique performance associated with them. But if we take the example of the square plaque diffuser, here's a typical catalog page for a square plaque diffuser. This particular table has 24 by 24 uh, face size. So for a diffuser, uh, a lot of times the table will be set up specifically for the face size. Uh, we often use diffusers in a T-bar ceiling, so 24 by 24 or 2 by 2 tiles. Uh, this is something that we would see. The face size is set, but within that set face size, we can have a variety of different inlet connection sizes. For this particular product, it ranges from a 6-inch diameter to a 15-inch diameter. And much like the grills, we have a range of neck velocities. This one is 400 to 1600 feet per minute. If we zoom in a little bit more, we can look at a size 10. And if we have a size 10 at those velocities, that will correlate to a CFM volume. Again, like we had with the grills, we have a neck velocity that gives us a certain velocity pressure as well as a certain total pressure. There is a sound performance aspect associated with that. And there is a throw distance. So much like our grill performance, if we scroll down to the bottom of the page, we would expect to see uh, performance notes that uh, further explain the performance in the tables. And much like our grill, we have 150 feet per minute, 100 feet per minute, and 50 feet per minute. I do want to point out that throw for diffusers is also based on isothermal conditions. What does this mean? So looking at isothermal conditions in a horizontal application, uh, basically isothermal means that the room air temperature is equal to the supply air temperature. Uh, we test it this way for a couple reasons. One is uh, it simplifies the testing process. If we had to maintain a delta T, that adds an extra level of complexity to the testing. By using equal temperature, uh, that's one less variable that we have to deal with. And so uh, it results in more repeatable, reliable performance data with isothermal. Using this, we can then apply that catalog data to heating and cooling. So when we're looking at performance data in heating, we would expect that throw to be extended. That warm, buoyant air will travel further. As a general rule, we say 1% per degree Fahrenheit. That means that if we're looking at a supply air temperature of 90 degrees and a room air temperature of somewhere in the range of 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we would see that throw length increase 15 to 20 percent versus what's in the catalog for horizontal applications. Looking at cooling, the opposite is true. That cold, dense air will want to drop. So for that reason, uh, we see shorter throws. But the same rule or a similar rule applies in terms of 1% per degree Fahrenheit. So as an example, uh, with a supplier temperature of 55 degrees, and again, a room air temperature in the range of 70 to 75 degrees, we would expect the throw length in horizontal applications to be about 15 to 20% shorter. Switching now to vertical throw uh, and looking at downward vertical throw, again, Typically, catalog performance is going to be based on isothermal conditions with that supply air temperature equal to the room air temperature. But the opposite is true in heating. Uh, we're going to see shorter throws with that downward vertical throw. Those shorter throws, again, are related to the warm, buoyant air. With cooling, we expect that throw length to increase, again, by that 1% per degree Fahrenheit. That cold, dense air is going to want to fall and naturally that throw length is just going to increase. And so these rules are something that we need to be mindful of when we are designing and looking at that catalog throw length. 
what impact does that delta T have on us? And uh, specifically, we are looking at 50 feet per minute, and it is 50 feet per minute within, you know, I would say a range of max of, of 20 to 25 degrees delta T. Once you get beyond that, uh, it gets, uh, the rule doesn't hold true as well. Uh, but within that range of 20 to 25 degree delta T, um, it's, it's a pretty good rule of thumb. I highlight this uh, for perimeter zones specifically. Um, perimeter zones, rarely are we uh, just doing cooling. Uh, there is a need for heating and cooling in those spaces. And selecting one diffuser to achieve both heating and cooling can be a challenge because in perimeter zones, specifically when we have a lot of glazing, ideally we want to wash the window, so get coverage from ceiling to floor. Um, and that warm, buoyant air is not gonna wanna travel down. When we're using that same diffuser for cooling, uh, it is a challenge to get that, uh, you know, prevent that cold air from traveling too far and into the room where we can get drafts. So that is something that we need to be mindful of specifically uh, in those perimeter zones when we are looking at heating and cooling out of one air outlet. Coming back to the notes on the catalog page, uh, I'm gonna look at uh, diffuser testing. Uh, in a ceiling specifically, and the idea of Coanda effect. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to avoid going down the rabbit hole of Coanda, but uh, to briefly describe it, Coanda is what happens when a diffuser is installed in a ceiling, and most catalog data does assume it's installed in a ceiling. The high velocity air uh, will want to naturally cling to the ceiling, and a well-designed diffuser will have an aerodynamic profile that encourages this, encourages this to happen. So, like I said, uh, the test catalog test values are assuming that that diffuser is installed in the ceiling in most cases. Um, and it's important because when there's no ceiling, we're going to see a reduction in throw length. If there is no ceiling present, and I would say most of the restaurants and, and retail stores that I go into these days um, just have that open ductwork appearance, all painted matte black, and uh, to be aware that in that scenario that we would see a decrease in throw. And that's why this note here is indicating that catalog throw lengths uh, should have a correction factor of 0.7 applied when um, there is no ceiling present. Shifting next to the test standard, so air outlets are tested in accordance with ASHRAE 70. We're not gonna go into a great amount of detail of ASHRAE standard test methods, uh, but it is the test method that's used to test most air outlets. And the piece of this that I want to highlight is that standard uh, specifies that to test it appropriately, we need three equivalent duct diameters of straight hard duct upstream of the air outlet. How often is this available in uh, the real world? Uh, based on my experience, very little. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to achieve as much straight duct as we can. Um, you know, why do we have three equivalent duct diameters? The idea is that that creates good airflow conditions. And the idea, again, with test standards is providing repeatable, reliable data. And to do that, three equivalent duct diameters are required, even though that's not our reality on most job sites. So, of course, we have ideal. Um, we should try to achieve it when we can, but knowing that that's not realistic. but I've seen a lot of bad installations in terms of inlet conditions and the idea of snaking flex duct through the plenum space and eventually getting to an air outlet um, can be a reality. In most cases, uh, you know, flex duct should be limited to three to five uh, feet um, and the idea of it being as straight as possible because when flex duct, or sorry, when flex duct is uh, kinked, or when it is bent, uh, it tends to kink up once it's pressurized, uh, resulting in, in potentially very bad uh, installations. And um, there are just some things we shouldn't do. And, and this is a photo from a job site. Uh, and yes, that is a shoe box with caulking on the back of a wall. Uh, this is supposed to be the transition or, or the plenum to a sidewall grill. And um, I don't know where to start with, uh, with that. And, and it's just something that obviously we want to avoid probably not meeting flame and spoke requirements either. 
So looking at airflow patterns related to inlets, uh, we have an example of a uh, directional diffuser here. We have uh, ISO valves. That red is going to be our 150 feet per minute. The green is showing our, or our 100 feet per minute, and the blue is showing our 50 feet per minute. When we look at this under a variety of different conditions, we see that ideal condition on the left-hand side has a very uniform pattern for all four air jets. Uh, and again, that's what we would expect with ideal conditions. If we move to the right and see that hard elbow, uh, we do see that the airflow pattern, the ISO valves are skewed a little bit to one side. Now going to a flex duct elbow, uh, it's skewed significantly and that we have higher jets towards the bottom and the right hand side than we do towards the top and the left. Same is true with the hard T. And of course we see side inlets becoming more common just because we have less and less room in the plenum. Um, a lot of times architects want to have that large space, so leaving us less room in the plenum um, results in something like a side inlet. Now this particular inlet doesn't have any baffles inside. Baffles can certainly help us um, uh, with you know, better airflow patterns, but that does add pressure drop and sometimes sound. On the topic of performance, um, you know, ideally we have, uh, you know, that straight duct, but the impact is, goes beyond just the airflow pattern itself. And because poor inlet conditions result in turbulence, uh, we do see, you know, higher velocities on one side than the other, so we get localized velocities. This generates more sound, and this generates more pressure drop. So um, this is really all kind of wraps up back to uh, giving us as much straight duct as possible um, and, and trying to achieve that on the job site whenever possible. Going next to sound and the idea of NC values. NC values are ingrained in the industry and specifically grills, registers, and diffusers. NC values are cataloged uh, by most manufacturers. When we see an NC curve, if you're not familiar with it, we have sound levels along one side, and then we have a range of frequencies, typically uh, the typical eight octave bands from 63 hertz up to 8,000 hertz. And then we have a series of curves that set our NC. And values are plotted, and in this example, the red line across are our plotted values at the different frequencies. We can see because this line crosses the, the highest point, crosses the NC35 line, this example gives us NC35. The other item that I want to point out on this chart is NC15, and it would be pretty typical uh, for an NC curve for the bottom value to be NC15. The reason being is, well, um, the principles behind uh, NCs really don't work that low. The other aspect is if you are designing a space that actually needs to be NC15 or lower, uh, you, you shouldn't be using NC values. Um, that would justify looking at uh, sound power values uh, in each of the octave bands and doing a more detailed analysis of acoustics. So when it comes to the NC values, typically we uh, anything below NC15 is going to appear as a dash in the catalog. Um, rather than a value. Sticking with sound performance and NCs, uh, looking at some of the assumptions that are made with sound performance for air outlets. Uh, the assumptions are uh, that uh, there is only one diffuser. So the performance is based on a single sound source, one diffuser. It is based on a space in the range of 400 to 600 square feet. There is some distance away from your sound source. Uh, it, it, for air outlets, it's typically about five feet away from the sound source, and some room absorption. Um, whether it's carpet, furniture, uh, even the clothes that people are wearing, uh, that, was, that provides us some room absorption. And it is typical within the industry to assume 10 dB across all octave bands. How often are you designing a space that only has one inlet, uh, or sorry, one uh, device? So not very frequently other than small private offices. So when we do look at a space that does have multiple outlets, in this case, we're looking at an example of four in a 20 by 20 room. 
If we select that one diffuser for NC25 and we put four of them in the space, we would expect each of those diffusers to contribute to a larger sound source. Uh, and there is logarithmic math that you can do to calculate it, but there is a table uh, that can help us with this located in uh, a number of different places. And in this particular example, four identical diffusers, each selected for NC25, would end up yielding a sound level in the space closer to NC31 because that four or those four outlets combine to be six decibel higher um, than one single item. So again, multiple items uh, will give us uh, an increased sound level in the space. If we have, uh, you know, our, our occupants in the room are located a certain distance away from the sound source, and as you travel away from the sound source, it uh, appears uh, not as loud. So if we're looking at why do we use 400 to 600 square feet, um, again, looking at those spaces, we have a person, you know, fairly equal distance from all of them. He will hear the contributing sound from those four items. As we get into larger spaces, uh, double or triple the size, the diffusers a little bit further away aren't likely to impact what that occupant hears in the space. And certainly they won't hear the sound levels all the way across the other side of the room. So even if we're looking at a 50,000 square foot room with um, you know, 50 or 60 diffusers in it, uh, we're not gonna look at all of those and add up all of those sound sources Typically, we're sticking to a space of still 400 to 600 square feet uh, within, you know, close proximity to our occupant. Um, and that's something to be mindful of when we are looking at these sound, uh, the sound aspect of our design. So let's look at different types of outlets now. I like to say uh, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox when it comes to selecting our air outlets. And if you've ever done carpentry or uh, worked on cars or, or done woodworking, um, you will understand that the right tool for the job does make the job a lot easier. And certainly within air outlets, there are some products that are can be generally applied. They're very uh, you know uh, versatile. And then there are some that are designed for very unique applications. And having all those tools in the toolbox um, is certainly uh, helpful to achieve the design goal, but can be overwhelming. In terms of where we locate them, you know, we've been talking about overhead mixed air distribution systems. So of course, locating them in the ceiling makes sense, but sometimes putting them in the high sidewall um, is a better option. And whether that's because the ceiling is very architectural and the architect doesn't want anything in the ceiling, there just might not be room for the air outlet because of AV equipment or lighting. Um, but also really tall spaces. So dealing with spaces that are 30 or 40 feet high, uh, locating that diffuser in the sidewall uh, might be desirable because it's really that six feet above the finished floor that we're looking at, uh, you know, conditioning. So um, sidewalls are, are a nice solution for certain applications. And the last is, even though it's overhead mixed air distribution, uh, sometimes we locate it in the floor. And the best example that I can think of of that is in perimeter zones along the glazing, uh, linear bar grills uh, used in that application. So going back to products, um, and I threw in a few images of a typical installation because it's one thing to look at a product, it's another to look at it, uh, you know, installed. And so you've likely seen egg crate grills somewhere in a, in a ceiling, um, and those are typically going to be our return grills. Linear bar grills, have fixed blades as well. Um, so return grills are always fixed blade. Supply uh, grills that are gonna be in the floor are gonna have fixed blades for probably logical reasons that you know if someone were to step on it, you know that adjustable blade could you know shift. Uh, so in most cases, they are gonna be fixed blades. Our single deflection and double deflection, uh, we've talked about a little bit earlier, and the idea that those do have adjustable blades. In most cases, uh, I'm seeing them in the sidewall. Uh, there are instances where they are installed in a ceiling as well. But when it comes to looking at sizing the grill itself, 
Um, you know, I like to look at this example here of two different diffusers, or sorry, two different grills, one 12 inches by 6 inches and another one 24 inches by 12 inches. Both of them are operating at 550 CFM. No surprise, the air velocity is lower out of the larger grill. And because we have lower velocities, we're going to expect lower static pressure. We're also going to expect lower sound levels. The interesting part of this is that the throw length at 50 feet per minute doesn't change or changes negligibly. And that is because throw length for a grill, and you know I'm looking at the same grill at the same set point, um, is impacted more by the mass flow rate, so the volume of air uh, rather than the actual size of it. However, the size, uh, you know, going to a larger size does have some performance benefits. The reason we don't typically put in extremely large grills is because one, room to actually do that. Uh, two is cost. Obviously, a larger grill is going to cost more, and if you have a larger grill, you're going to need larger ductwork as well that costs more. So, space and uh, cost are typically the driving factors, um, and you know, the reality is, the larger the grill, um, the the lower the sound level and the lower the pressure drop we would expect. So that's looking at one grill in two different sizes, but then the actual geometry, the construction, uh, the, you know, the blade spacings, or, or in some cases perforated grills, um, have different performance associated with them because of the free area. And if we look at the free area of an egg crate grill, uh, 400 CFM compared to a louvered grill at 400 CFM, both 12 by 6, we can see that that pressure drop increases the sound increases by almost 10 dB, which would be perceived as twice as loud. If we take this a step further and look at a perforated grill with even smaller free area, same operating conditions, we would expect a pressure, or a pressure drop of about 0.45 and a NC of around 38. So the type of grill can also help you um, in terms of achieving the performance characteristics that you're looking for. Looking at radial pattern diffusers, whether that's a round cone diffuser, a square cone diffuser, or a square plaque diffuser, all quite common um, air outlet types, these all have what are called radial patterns, and that radial pattern moves equally out away from the diffuser in all directions. Because it's moving in all directions, the throw length typically is shorter. And uh, a nice feature of these radial pattern diffusers is they typically are impacted less uh, by poor inlet conditions. Looking at directional diffusers, this is an example of a louvered face diffuser. Um, this is a modular core diffuser, so it achieves the same thing in terms of directional pattern, but has a different look, as well as perforated diffusers uh, that have a perforated face, but in behind that perforated face, uh, there are pattern controllers. Directional diffusers will have a more distinct jet um, that will travel further. And because they have uh, distinct jets, we see them sometimes, you know, this example is showing four-way, but the idea of three-way uh, if it's going up against the wall, two-way if it's going in a corner perhaps, and uh, a one-way pattern where it is, uh, you know, being directed towards a heat source maybe. As I mentioned, when we're looking at floor versus sidewall, sometimes there isn't, it isn't possible to always locate the diffuser directly in the center of the room. Sometimes we have to move, move the diffuser out towards the perimeter and direct the airflow inward towards um, the center of the room. Uh, as long as we are getting the mixing and the throw patterns that we're looking for, uh, this is a potential solution for uh, the location of the diffuser. High induction twist diffusers. Uh, quite honestly, these are sometimes selected because of their unique appearance, um, but beyond that unique appearance, they do have uh, a very specific throw pattern, and that throw pattern is kind of a swirl or a twist pattern, we would say, and this type of diffuser ends up having a shorter throw length um, just because of the swirling turbulent flow that it has, um, and it encourages mixing within the room. Um, 
you know, one of the solutions or one of the applications I see this in is where there are high loads in the space and we're delivering high air volume and those shorter throw lengths are desirable. If our supply air temperature has a high delta T, so if we're using a, you know, a high temperature differential and cooling, uh, the twist pattern can help us in terms of getting that mixing. That twist pattern encourages mixing and, uh, you know, uh, gets, gets the, the the supplier temperature closer to room air temperature faster. Another unique solution in terms of diffusers is uh, modulating diffusers. And VAV diffusers provide uh, an extra level of control with a similar appearance to a square plaque. Air volume is controlled directly at the diffuser by modulating components within the diffuser itself. Um, this can be done electronically or it can be done with uh, wax actuators. The benefit of modulating the airflow directly at the diffuser uh, gives us the ability to create more individualized zones. Uh, we know that people have different uh, perceptions of thermal comfort and whether that's just their metabolism, whether that's the clothing they wear, uh, and just whether they like it to be warmer or colder, um, people have different needs. And so the idea of modulating diffusers allow us to do that. Uh, there is certainly a premium cost associated to uh, a modulating diffuser, but it does give us a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, achieving thermal comfort. Nozzle diffusers are kind of, you know, a more unique tool in the toolbox, but I would say almost every airport I've ever been in has nozzle diffusers somewhere. Uh, food courts are another application where I see them, and that is because they are capable of throwing very long lengths, in some cases hundreds of feet. And when we are trying to provide volumes of air into these large open spaces, that very long throw length is helpful uh, to achieve that. Linear slot diffusers um, are something that we see quite often in perimeter zones. In this example here, it's along uh, the wall and uh, treating the glazing within the space. Um, linear slot diffusers are often used also in highly architectural spaces. Uh, the long, straight, continuous lengths uh, are often desirable by architects and are very helpful in terms of integrating air distribution into the design of the space. Here's an example of a mud in frame in a bulkhead. So now instead of being located in the ceiling, it's in installed in a bulkhead or a sidewall application. Uh, and again, this gives us some flexibility in terms of conditioning these um, highly architectural spaces. So to look at a diffuser, um, we have a beam or some sort of supply in the center of the room. And uh, many times people have asked, you know, is the entire section active? And while it can be, that's not necessary. Uh, the diffuser can be supplied in long continuous lengths, but only small sections of it being active. Um, active and inactive sections allow us to provide that nice continuous length look, um, but um, size for the air volume appropriate. Uh, by having these inactive sections, we can actually use them as returns and uh, you get great air motion in terms of having that diffuser air go out away from the diffuser, loop back around to the diffuser itself and use that as the return. So now we don't need to find a place to put an egg crate grill somewhere in that ceiling. We can actually just use the inactive sections of the diffuser. So summing this all up, looking at the air outlets, um, the tools in our toolboxes, I would say, uh, we have a variety of different options here. And if we look at the NC values, they are all within a range of 21 to 29, uh, which is typically a reasonable sound level uh, to select at. But if you look at the pressure drop, we are looking at significantly different pressure drops. That square cone diffuser is 0.03 versus the nozzle diffuser that's almost half an inch. But I would also point out that the throw of that square cone diffuser is about nine feet. The throw of the nozzle diffuser is 45. So Looking at tools in the toolbox beyond just the way they look, uh, they do have unique performance characteristics, uh, again, that can help us achieve that design goal. So to finish things off, I would like to look at an example of a typical room. And we're going to go back to this 20 by 20 foot room. Uh, we have a 10 foot ceiling in there. 
and we've determined that we need to deliver 1,000 CFM to that space. Recapping again that, you know, as the air comes out of the diffuser, we want to size that so that the air jet is achieving 50 feet, about 50 feet per minute as it approaches the occupied zone. This is to try to achieve an air velocity within the occupied zone of 40 feet per minute or less. When we have multiple diffusers, obviously we're going to the wall uh, and that makes sense, but where those two diffuser air plans collide, um, this can be undesirable if the throw length is too long because now they will collide and those airflow patterns will come down into the occupied zone at high velocities, causing drafts. If the diffuser is sized appropriately, this can work in our benefit because the two airflow patterns will collide and come downward, encouraging that room air mixing that we're looking for. But as long as it's below 50 feet per minute as it enters the occupied zone, we should be fine. So here is our ceiling plan, diffuser layout. The diffusers are eight feet apart, and the diffusers are also four feet away from the wall. Looking vertically, our design goal is to have 50 feet per minute as it enters the occupied zone. If we have a 10-foot ceiling and the occupied zone is six feet above the finished floor, that leaves us with a four-foot throw length. So what is our ideal throw length? Well, that's going to be a combination of that horizontal throw, A, and the vertical throw, B, uh, giving us an overall throw length of 8 feet. This means that since we have four diffusers in the space, we need to select four diffusers for 250 CFM that have a throw of 8 feet. I'm going to start by looking at the louvered face diffusers and seeing if I can find a selection. So looking in the range of 250 CFM, I can see that um, the six by six isn't gonna work because the catalog page max is out at 225. So I'm gonna go to the larger size, next size up is nine by nine. Looking at that 250 CFM, uh, so we don't have exactly 250 CFM, but we can interpolate between the 225 and the 282 CFM. Um, but we can see that the throw lengths here are 18 feet at 225 and 21 feet at uh, 282, uh, significantly longer than what we actually need. So I'm going to switch to uh, a square cone diffuser now, which is going to have shorter throws. So looking at a 24 by 24 square cone diffuser with a 6 inch connection, uh, we can see that that throw length is between 8 and 9 feet. Uh, at 250 CFM. However, NC values are 29, between 29 and 34. If I'm designing that space for NC25, that's going to be undesirable. By looking at the next size up, going to the unit size 8, so now we have that same 24 by 24 with an 8-inch inlet on the back. Uh, we, in that range of 250 CFM, we can see at 244, we have a throw of 8 feet uh, at 279, we have a throw of 9 feet, and NC values are 19 or less. So this looks like it's going to be excellent for our application. Um, and so to sum that up, we're going to use the square cone diffuser that's 24 by 24 with an 8-inch inlet. We're going to have four of them, each operating at 250 CFM. The throw length is 9 feet, but we do have to correct for our delta T, which is 15. So now we're going to see a 15% decrease on that catalog throw length because it is uh, in cooling. That means that our expected throw length out of this diffuser at our operating condition is 7.7 .7 feet. Uh, we said eight. This is more than uh, within the acceptable tolerance range, in my opinion. Um, I do like to point out that catalog values are not uh, catalog to three decimal places, uh, it's just not that accurate. But being mindful of all of these variables that we've just talked about uh, will help us achieve those design goals. So to summarize this all, throw in the occupied zone. Typically the design goal is to supply for 50 feet per minute as it approaches the occupied zone. This should help us achieve uh, that 40 feet per minute or less within the occupied zone itself but still get good room air mixing. Inlet conditions, 
Ideally, we want three equivalent duct diameters of straight hard duct equal to the connection size. Certainly realize that's not realistic on a lot of job sites, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to get as much straight duct as we can. Uh, it will have an impact on the performance of the air outlet, and, and so we should try to get that as long as possible. Supply air temperatures. The temperature differential between our supply air and our room air will impact throw and will impact room air mixing, so something to be mindful of. And of course, sound levels. Uh, GRD products are cataloged to NC values, but there are a number of assumptions made within those NC values, and we should, um, you know, if our space that we're designing deviates from those assumptions made, is something that we need to be aware of. If we are designing extremely sound sensitive spaces, uh, we should avoid, uh, you know, we should probably be looking at sound power values and, and not NC values. So that concludes uh, the presentation on selecting air outlets for overhead mixed air distribution systems. Uh, I think we'll open it up to questions, Julia, if we have any. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you to everyone who has submitted questions throughout the webinar. If you would like to submit a question now, please use the question function found on your webinar toolbar. We'll spend the next few minutes answering some of your submitted questions, and Ryan will answer as best as he can. Ryan, our first question is, there are a lot of design considerations here. Are there any models or software to help with this? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things to consider, certainly, um, and there is, uh, software available. And I guess one of the things that we're seeing at Price is uh, people working in Revit. And having software that integrates into Revit is, uh, you know, the workflow that people are wanting to use and the idea of add-ins that help do some of these calculations in your actual space uh, can be very helpful tools to, to consider um, all of these variables as we're designing. Um, and then I guess I would add to that too, you know, in extremely complicated spaces, um, you know, CFD uh, is a tool that we can look at using. And, uh, you know, there's a number of different providers for that, but uh, in extremely difficult spots, using uh, computational fluid dynamics to assess what those air outlets are doing under very specific conditions is, is again, a useful tool. Great, thank you so much. Our next question is, are there particular diffuser designs that tolerate inlet effects better? Um, yeah, and I mean, I guess in my experience, something with the radial pattern, so like a square plaque or a square cone or a round cone diffuser, uh, tend to, you know, handle those, those poor inlet conditions better than something that is directional that has, uh, you know, a pattern with distinct jets in it. Awesome, thank you so much. Another question that we have, can you balance linear diffusers at the face of the diffuser? Many times they are, they are installed in hard ceilings with no access to the duct balancing damper. Uh, yeah, so uh, slot diffusers will have adjustable pattern controllers, um, but they are pattern controllers and they are there to uh, set the airflow pattern. And, Sometimes they're adjustable from horizontal to vertical or, or you're wanting to change the angle. Uh, they are there for pattern. I have heard of people adjusting the, you know, um, using them to fine tune the air volume, but that can result in higher sound levels because that is directly in the occupied space. It can also impact the airflow pattern of the diffuser. Ideally, we want those uh, dampers to be installed further upstream and something like a cable operated damper can help uh, you know, achieve that uh, balancing in that hard ceiling. So the, basically the cable operator comes to the slot and that can be adjusted. Um, the further back we can get it in the ductwork, the less likely it's going to impact, have a significant impact on our sound performance. Thank you so much. We have one more question. What type of diffusers and supply air grills for clean rooms, kitchen and labs with fume hoods? So we didn't touch on those. Uh, we were looking at more typical um, commercial spaces, but a lot of times, you know, I, well, and, and each of them kind of have some unique scenarios to them. But if we look at, um, you know, kitchen, there are diffusers that have, um, you know, more laminar flow because we don't want a strong airflow pattern that is going to um, 
impact the performance of, of uh, kitchen hoods. Um, you know, so radial flow diffusers are, are used there. Um, you know, a lot of critical environment applications will look at laminar flow diffusers, and there's entire presentations on that aspect of it. So again, uh, we're just kind of scratching the surface in terms of the different air outlets we're looking at. As we get into more specific uh, applications, uh, we have to dig a little deeper in the toolbox to, to find the right tool for those uh, applications. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering all of the questions. Um, we do have just about two more minutes left. In approximately one week, a recording of the webinar along with answers to all unanswered questions will be emailed. So if you do have any more questions, please send them in right now and we will gladly get the answers back to you shortly. All of those that have signed in will receive an email within 24 hours with a link to request the quiz to earn your PDH credit. If you missed some of the content or need a review, you have the opportunity to review the PDF copy of the presentation available to download in the handout section of the webinar toolbar. If you have any questions concerning the webinar or your PDH credit, please email us at webinar at priceindustries.com.